Bibles, please, I want you to start with two places tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I want you to find that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and mark that, and then Psalm 96. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and Psalm 96. If you need the notes tonight, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. little teachy tonight, some doctrinal teaching, some basic teaching, so more of a Bible study, but always with every teaching there's some preaching. With every preaching there ought to be some teaching, but a lot of teaching I think tonight, and we'll get out of here in time for uh, Saturday morning soul winning, so don't worry about that. No, we'll get out of here uh, shortly. Psalm 96, verse number 8. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come to His courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies, Lord. Thank you for the freedoms we have to gather here. We don't have to slip in through the afternoon and hide. We can don't have to worry about singing too loud. We just thank you for that. We thank you for the kids next door. They're able to uh, teach them and have them come and learn about you as well. Lord, we thank you. We can bring our Bibles very clearly, very openly. We can set them uh, with us wherever we go. We can teach. We can witness. Lord, we thank you for that. But Lord, I ask that you help us tonight in these few minutes to learn something. And Father, if it's something we've already known, we'll be reminded of it, and we'll certainly make fresh commitments to it. But Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts, refresh our minds and our understanding new and afresh, that we might leave from here in just a little bit more excited about who you are, more in awe of who you are, more desirous to be all that you would have us to be. So Lord, help us be attentive. Thank you for folks that have come many right from work, still have things to do. Uh, tonight and preparing for tomorrow, but Lord, we've set aside this time to pause, to focus on you, to focus on eternal things here in the middle of week. Lord, we just ask you to speak to us. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. This is the second in our new series for Wednesday night in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness. And that comes from that psalm verse we just read about worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness, as we saw last week, is what's well, forgotten by a lot of Christians. It just is. It's something that was not uh, promoted as much. We don't think about it. And when we do think about it, we excuse ourselves why we don't have to think about holiness as we ought. Uh, the idea that God teaches us about holiness, that's not to make us feel bad. It's not to, as we'll see in a second, some things that help us along those lines. But it is to challenge us and learn how to be holy. And in fact, we saw last week about worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is beautiful. When we think about the beauty of God and His holiness, it's a beautiful thing. It's something beyond our comprehension. It's something beyond our, our, our thinking processes. But it is a beautiful thing. And we're to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And we spoke about the beauty of God's holiness and then how I believe God sees when we try to let Christ live in us and model His holiness, it's beautiful to Him also. But we saw last week, we saw about the beauty of holiness. And if we worship the Lord, in that beauty of holiness, we saw it's going to make us sing out. We saw about singing unto the Lord. That beauty, when we see the worship, the holiness of God, it'll make us sing. It'll make us show forth and also serve up. We can't help but serve. So tonight we're looking at this idea of perfection and perfecting of holiness. The perfection of and the perfecting of holiness. The perfection of holiness is God. You say, what does holiness look like? It's God. What, what, what models holiness? How can I get, how can I, as best I can, wrap my mind and my heart about what holiness is? It is God. But then, as we saw in, and we'll look at, we may get to it tonight, we may not, in, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, it talks about us, we ourselves, from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, perfection of holiness is God. But then God wants us to start perfecting holiness in our lives, trying to model it, trying to grow in it. So, the goal, is to be holy like God is holy. 
But here's some cautions. Because as soon as we start thinking about us trying to be holy like God is, the devil's going to be right there and get us in trouble. The devil's going to be right there and give us the wrong spirit and wrong attitude. So we are to be holy, as we've seen and we will see, like God is holy. That should be the goal. The caution is we cannot be and must not be, but this is the human nature, holier than thou. We cannot get to the place, and we have to be very careful that we're not holier than thou. As soon as we think we're holier than thou, we're not. As soon as we think we're holy, as soon as we think we're really something, as soon as we think ourselves better than anybody else, regardless of the circumstances, because of my holiness, we are in fault. It's, we, but the problem is we get like the Pharisee. Remember the Pharisee standing there in the temple praying with himself, saying, I'm glad I'm not like other men, talking about the, 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 the publican right there. See, as soon as we think we're holier than thou, as soon as we think we've arrived, we have not. And so one goal tonight is to let God speak to our heart. And as soon as we think that, the Holy Spirit would convict us and we'd get right with God. So we're not talking about being holier than thou. We have to guard against that. Pride comes in. So the goal is not to be holier than thou, listen carefully, but to always be holier than now. Are you listening to me? Our goal ought to always be more holy, more like the Savior. Because if I'm saying I'm holier than thou, that means I'm measuring my holiness against somebody else. And God says we're fools when we do that, when we measure ourselves, compare ourselves among ourselves. That's being foolish. So, as soon as I think I'm holier than thou, somebody else, I've blown it. But the goal is always be holier than, what class? Now. Always more like the Savior. Always growing. Now, how many have figured out that this idea of trying to be more like the Savior is give and take back sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You go a little bit, and you go back a little bit. Hopefully you go back and you go forward a little bit more than you go back. But we're always, it's constant. So tonight you might say, well, preacher, I've tried that and, and I've just faltered. I've tried to be more like Savior, and I just go back. That, that's part of the human condition. Understanding that we are to be striving, but we fall back. You cannot find somebody in the Bible who did not fall back, who did not have some issues. So we have to be on guard about that. So holier than thou, no, but holier than now. Six months, a year from now, just tomorrow even, our goal ought to be more like Christ. So that's the goal as we look at this idea and the beauty of holiness. So we're we'll looking at different things God says is holy over the next few weeks and months and years and decades as God allows us to go. So tonight, again, a little more teaching and a little more summary than we find than sometimes on a Wednesday night. So looking at the perfection of holiness, which is God, and then the perfecting of holiness is what we're supposed to be doing as we see in that verse. So tonight, first of all, looking at the perfection of holiness. The perfection of holiness. What is perfect holiness? It's God. It is God. And in fact, it's the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Many times we talk about the Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity is holy not because it's a trinity, because it's a trinity of God. And God is holy. Again, if you say, preacher, what is holiness? It's God. So what's my goal to be holy? It's be like God. And so we find the Holy Trinity. First of all, we find the Holy Trinity, little teaching tonight, is presented in Scripture. It's presented in the Scripture. See, the, the Trinity is not something man made up. The Trinity is not something we just try to put out as an illustration. It is Bible. It is Bible. And so we're going to, I think I got most of the verses that we're going to talk about tonight there in your uh, notes so we don't have to spend the time looking. And it's just some of them, but it's going to give us an understanding, this idea as best we can of Trinity. So, first of all, it's presented, this idea of Holy Trinity is presented in Scripture, it's presented as triune, as triune. And that's just kind of a fancy word, and what it basically means is three in one, Three separate entities, three separate persons, but all one God, and three all at the same time. And we're going to see that. So it's three in one, three individual individuals, three unique individuals, but one God, and three existing at the same time. 
Now, you say, preacher, you gotta teach me, you gotta, gotta help me understand that. I can't help you understand that. It's beyond our pay grade to really fully understand. We can see the scripture, we can grow in the scripture, we can begin to get a sense of what God is when He talks about the Trinity, and by faith we're gonna find it affects our lives. But at the same time, we cannot wrap our mind fully around the Trinity because it's above our pay grade. I often use the illustration, it's a brain surgeon talking to a five-year-old. And we're the five-year-old. The brain surgeon who has spent years and years, who is so much higher plane, describing what he's going to do to the five-year-old, he can't do it. The best he can do is say, there's something inside your daddy's brain that's not right, so we're going to take it out, we're going to heal it up, and we're going to put a bandage on it, and we're going to give medicine try to make it better. You say, that's pretty simple. Yeah. And so as we look at it, God explains the Trinity to us as best we can. We're going to understand it. But it is vital that we understand what the Trinity is and what it is not. We have one God. Amen? One God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not three gods molded into one. It's one God making up of three persons. And so that's vital when we begin looking at it. So it's presented as triune. Again, triune, we're talking about three in one, three individuals, one God, and three existing at the same time. Each of those are part of, are important to it. Notice if you would, I think it's the second or third verse you've got in your notes. First John 5, 7. It says, for there, how many class? There are what? Three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, capital W from John 1, that's Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. These three are what class? One. Now if you have an NIV, it's not in there. It's in the Bible, it's just not in the NIV. But it is. These three are one. So, we've got three that bear record in heaven. Three of them that are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. They're three unique individuals, three distinct individuals, but making up one God. And so let's look at some just some verses. We're not going to talk a lot about them, but just laid out some here to help us understand, to help us put our mind around it, and help somebody else maybe understand what God is talking about. So in Genesis 1.26, one of the first places that the Trinity is discussed, without discussing it as Trinity, but it says, And God said, so who said it, class? God, God said it, let us make man in our image. So the first illustration, the first speaking of the Trinity, of the, the triune God, is in right in Genesis. That God said, let us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, those three are one. He said, let us make man in our image. So again, we've, just, we've taught about that. So triune God is much like we are triune beings also. We are body, soul, and spirit. And so there we are three parts and three ones, but that falls way short of what God is in Trinity. But so in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us. Genesis 3, 22, and the Lord God said, so God said, behold, a man is become as one of who class? Us, to know good and evil. And so also there he is speaking about in other places in Genesis, it's us, it's us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those three are one. Then he goes on in 1 Peter 1, 2, just some verses, where we've got the three at the same time, three in their distinct functions, three in their distinct operations, but one. Talking about the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling in the blood of Jesus Christ. So there's the three. The three at the same time, different functions, different applications, but still the one God, the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ. In John 10, 29, My Father which gave them, gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he does not include the Holy Spirit there, but we find that there it is. God, Jesus said, He and the Father are one. You say, whoa! We hear people all the time say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Lie, right there. He said, I'm the Father of one. We are one. Jesus many times said he is God. But there it is. The Father and Jesus is one. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which is the same as the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So there it is. We've got the Holy Ghost being sent by the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. He shall teach you all things. So the three in one verse. Matthew uh, 3, 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, Jesus Christ, and a voice from heaven, that's the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So those are just some verses where it talks about the three. Three at the same time, three distinct, 
but the three making up one, all combined together. And that's the God we serve. That's the God we talk about. One God in three persons, different functions, and we'll talk about those at a different time. So it's presented as triune, triune, the Trinity, three in one. You say, preacher, my brain still doesn't like it. I know. But I rejoice in it. We've got a God that's above our comprehension. Oh, what a marvelous thing. And the more we know about Him, the more we study Him, the more we can understand who He is. So we find the Trinity. Again, we're talking about in the beauty of holiness. Holiness. So number two, we find in the Scripture, it's, tried, it's presented as triune, but also the Trinity is presented as truly holy. As truly holy. Each one of the persons in the Trinity is holy. There's not one less holy than another. There's not one more holy than another. They are all equally God, and so they're all equally holy. And so we can't say, well, this one's less. No, there are just three in one, but each one. So notice number one, the Father is holy. God the Father is holy. Leviticus 20, 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord. Again, we find Lord is all in caps there, so that's Jehovah God. For I am the Lord am holy. So God there tells us He is holy. Jehovah the Father is holy. John seventeen eleven. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Christ speaking there, keep through thine own name those that thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So we have there the Holy Father. So the Father is holy. Most of us understand that. Most cults understand that. That God the Father is holy. But God the Son is also holy. God the Son is holy. Hebrews 7.26 For such a high priest, speaking about Christ, became us who is, what class? Holy. Who is what? Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. So the Son is holy. Uh, Mark 1, 24. Here we have the devil testifying. The demons testifying. Saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee that who thou art, the Holy One of God. So the devils recognize Jesus as the Holy One. So He is holy. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For He hath made Him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. You say, what is holiness? Sinlessness. Holiness is sinlessness, purity, no stains, no marks, no shadows, complete purity, complete holiness. And it says, for, Christ, for He, that is Christ, for God made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. So the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, and again, it's not holy because it's Trinity, it's holy because it's God. The three in one is presented in Scripture as triune and then it's truly holy. So we got God the Father's holy, God the Son holy, and then we don't spend a lot of verses because we're talking about the, what kind of spirit? Holy Spirit. Or just it's even in the name. And we've got one verse there, 11, Mark, uh, Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So the Holy Spirit is holy. So it's an amazing thing. We've got presented as triune, but also it is holy. Each one is holy. So we've got it presented in Scripture. Secondly, we find the Holy Trinity is personified in the Savior personified in the Savior. And again, this is a wonderful truth that you could meditate on, you could think upon uh, for all eternity and never fully wrap your mind completely around it. It's personified in the Savior. Colossians 2.9 For in Him, as Jesus Christ, dwelleth, what's the next word, class? All the, what's the next word? Fullness of the Godhead bodily. God refers to the Trinity as the Godhead. Acts 17, 29, just if you want to write that down, I don't think it's in your notes. Another place where it talks about the Godhead. For as much then as ye were the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by, graven by art and man's devices. So we have to understand the Godhead is not something that we made. It's not something like an idol, like gold or silver. We did not make it up. It's God is teaching it. But it says that Jesus is that in Him, in Jesus, dwelleth all 
the fullness. You can't get more than all, and you can't get more than the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So as we look at Jesus Christ, He is the fullness of the Godhead in body. We have God the Father, which is the Spirit. The Bible teaches us that we have to worship Him in spirit. But also we have the Holy Spirit, which is spirit. But then we have Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So to fully understand the Trinity, we can look at Jesus Christ, because He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's personifying God. He's personifying the Trinity. Very quickly, the Holy Trinity is then also provided for service. It's provided for service. So it's one thing to have a theological understanding. Oh, I understand it's three and one, and these three are one, and each one's distinct. Each one's got their own roles, but each one is, is equal. But it's also provided for service. It's something that God tells us and teaches us about the Trinity and just two areas of service. Now, they have many different functions. They Each one does many different things. But two we're looking at tonight where they work together. Two places where all three are working together for our service. Number one, the Trinity in supplication. The Trinity in supplication are in prayer. Ephesians 2.18, is that in your notes? All right, let's look at it. For through Him, that's Jesus Christ, we have access by one Spirit unto the Father. So there's the Trinity working together for our prayers. You say, preacher, how do we get our, how do we have access to God? How do we get our prayers to God? How can we pray to God? It's through the Trinity. Each one helps us in our prayer time. It says, for through Him, Jesus Christ, we have access by one Spirit unto the Father. So by the way of the torn flesh of Jesus Christ and us being born again and saved by Jesus, we have access to the Father through the Spirit by the Son. Oh boy, what a talk about an exciting prayer life we can have. The Trinity working together to help us to pray. That ought to change our prayer life. When we're praying and say, boy, when we say, our, our Father which art in heaven, you say, yes, I'm praying to the Father. But it's by one Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. Boy, that ought to just stir our hearts to make our prayer life even more. So it is through supplication. So the Trinity is provided, and God teaches us this, helps us in our prayer life. Our prayer life isn't just me and the Father. Our prayer life isn't just me and Jesus Christ. The prayer life isn't just me and the Holy Spirit, which makes intercession for us. It's all three in my prayer life. What a glorious thought God has for us. So it's there. It provides us in service in our Supplications. Number two, the Trinity is provided and helps us in our soul winning. In our soul winning. Two areas in which it helps us in our soul winning, the Trinity. Number one, in authority. We have the Trinity giving us authority to witness. The Trinity giving us authority to knock doors. The Trinity giving us authority to open up the Word of God and say, you need to trust Christ as Savior. Jesus died for you. Now again, we're not trying to be, a, we're not, we won't be, a, shouldn't be offensive. We shouldn't have the chip on our shoulder. But we have that boldness to go. We have the authority to go. And there it is in Mark, uh, or Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus spake, came and spake unto them, saying, all power, that's all authority, all power, everything he needs, is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the what class? Son and of the what? Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So we're going there in the authority of Jesus Christ and baptizing there with the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm glad those three are one, and each one is there. And we go, as when we knock a door, when you witness to your neighbor, when you witness to your family members, when you're doing it, you have that authority, but it's with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Not See, not one's not lower than the other. It's not less powerful than the other, but we have authority. So, it's Trinity helps us in our soul winning, in authority, and number two, in actions. In actions. Notice it says there in John 7, 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it expedient for you that I go away? For I go not away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So there we have Jesus sending the Comforter. We're witnessing of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit then is the one who brings conviction on the sinner. 
So we got Jesus, who we're witnessing about, him on the cross, the Holy Spirit bringing conviction to the sinner. See, I can't bring conviction to anybody. I can't help anybody. I can give them the scripture, but I can't make them understand that they need the Savior. I can't make them understand they're headed for hell. I can show them. I can explain it. But it's the Holy Spirit has to bring the conviction. So we got Jesus, who we're witnessing about, and what he did on the cross of Calvary, the Holy Spirit that he sent, and the Holy Spirit then brings conviction. And then in John 6, 44, it says, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. So the Father has to, send, has to draw the sinner. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction, and I'm testifying about the Son. It's the Trinity. That is the actions. If somebody gets saved, they get the conviction by the Holy Spirit. They're drawn by the Father unto the Son. What an exciting thing. So not only when we pray, but when we witness them, we've got the Trinity working with us as we serve our God. Oh, what a marvelous thing to know the Trinity. You say, preacher, what's the Trinity? It's holy. It's holy. We saw that. The perfecting of holiness. Let's move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So there's just some basic teaching about the Holy Trinity. That's the perfection of holiness. Oh, what is, per what is perfect holiness? The Trinity. The Trinity. All three as one. But then in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we find the perfecting of holiness. Yeah, the perfection of holiness, that's God. But God, as we see here, let's look at it again. Chapter, are you still with me tonight? Oh, I hope, you got your, hope your brain's working as fast as mine. Here we go. We're to be perfecting holiness. Chapter 7, verse number 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, this is what we're supposed to be, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The perfecting of holiness. That's the holiness of the saints. The holiness of the saints. God wants us to be holy as He is holy. Say, preacher, can we ever arrive at that? No. Not, not this side of heaven. No. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. We don't get holy enough and all of a sudden become a God ourselves, as the cult teaches. No, doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Talking to a young man a few months ago, he just knew that the only way he could be saved was to let the become perfect. Try to Not going to happen. It's not going to happen this side of heaven. But that's still the goal. The goal is holiness. The whole goal is to be holy like God. The goal is, there it is, the perfecting holiness. Making it complete in the fear of God. So, we've got the perfection of holiness. That's God. The perfecting of holiness. That's our duty. That's our goal. That's what God wants us to do in the life. So, let's look at the perfecting of holiness. Just some simple thoughts and we'll be done. Number one. We see, and by the way, that holiness comes through separation. As we separate from sin unto God, closer to God, modeling God, looking to God, from glory to glory, letting God work in us. And so in this passage, we find the perfecting of the saints. And again, so many areas, but this area is talking about separation. First of all, the promises of separation. The promises of separation. Chapter 7, verse number 1. Having, therefore, these promises. Remember, chapter divisions are not inspired. Many times you'll read that and you come like, for example, right here. Therefore, ha having, therefore, these promises. And if I was dividing it, and I wasn't there. I may look like I was there, but I'm not, I wasn't. If I was dividing up, I probably might include that verse with the previous chapter. So having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. So what promises are those? Chapter 6 Verse number 17. Let's go back up to verse 14. Because that's what he runs into, is having therefore these promises. What promises? Verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Biel? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And here's his promises. We do that, I will receive you. We're not talking about doing that for salvation. We're talking about God is giving us a unique relationship. He said, I'll receive you. 
I can, we can have that special relationship. We can have that special fellowship. He said, I will receive you. Number two, and I will be a father unto you. So he says, you do that. You live that way and you separate. I will be, I will receive you. Number two, I will be a father unto you. Number three, you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So there it is. There's the promises about separation. He said, there's something, if we will do that, wherefore, come out from among them, saith the Lord, be separate, touch not the unclean, and I will receive you, be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Now, again, we're not saying that we have to do that to be saved. He is our father. When you're saved, he's your father. Amen? But he said, we can have this fatherly relationship a little closer. We can manifest love. We can have that closeness that may not be otherwise without the separation. So there's the promises. But notice the practices of separation. Verse 7, or chapter 7, verse number 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, and boy, here's what he wants us to do. Let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So what is this perfecting of holiness in the fear of God? It's cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Again, it's trying to live sinless. It's not letting sin build in our life. It's not letting sin run rampant in our life. It's not saying, oh, well, I know this is not right, but I'm going to keep it. I know this is sin, this is filthy, but I'm going to keep it. I know that my spirit, see, it's not just the flesh, it's the spirit. Is that what it says? Notice what it says. From all filthiness of the flesh, us independent, fundamental, temperamental Baptists, we go on that one. And spirit. Filthy spirits. I don't think that's just limited to the fact of immoral, immoral thoughts or immoral spirits. We're talking about unforgiving. That's a, unforgiveness, that's a filthy spirit. An angry, bitter spirit, that's a filthy spirit. We're to cleanse ourselves from that. Why? Because we've got those promises. Having, therefore, these promises about being a father and receiving us and us being the sons and daughters, having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, Let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Make sure our spirit is right as well as our flesh. Perfecting. There it is. Making complete holiness of the fear of God. Notice the practices of separation. Number one, of association. Of association. Verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So there is that association of being yoked together, tied together, united together. He says, no, you, you don't do that. He says, you don't get yourself tied up, yoked together, working together like that with unbelievers. Uh, and we'll study that more than we've had before about uh, a mule and, a, and an ox don't work well together. It's a problem. It's a struggle. So he says, this association. So we have to be careful with our associations. Again, we're not going to go to a monastery somewhere out in the wilderness. That's not what it's talking about. But we're talking about in marriage. We're talking about in businesses, about starting a business. See, the problem is you start a business with an unbeliever. It may start out all right, but one day it's going to, you're going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to talk to you, and God's going to say, you need to do something with your business for God. And the unbeliever's going to say, No. So the separation, the practice of separation is of association, being yoked. Number two, of agreement, of agreement. Verse 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? God's, he says, how can you put the two together? How can you put righteous with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? How are you going to put light and darkness together? And what concord hath Christ with Biel? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? So the word concord means harmony. Agreement there, what we just read, it says, and the agreement there in the Greek means to deposit. To deposit oneself or your opinion. He said, what agreement? How can you deposit yourself with an unbeliever? How can you deposit Give yourself to an unbeliever. How can you have harmony with an unbeliever? So he's talking about separation as part of the perfecting of holiness. The next one is of among. Of among. Verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them. And be separate. Again, that doesn't mean we never talk or minister to or help lost people. 
but it means being part of it. For example, John 17, Jesus in, his, in the Lord's Prayer. And he says, And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And in verse 16 it says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. And so we may be with the lost to minister to them, to help them see Christ in us, but we're not of them. We're not of them. There'll always be, there's something different. There's always something unique. There's always something separate about them. Uh, we, we, we will work with them because we're, we work in the world. We're, we're here in the world. We'll minister to them. We'll help them. We'll befriend them. We're with them, but not of them. There's always that distinction. There needs to be always, there's something different about because of, because of Christ. Not because we're holier than thou, but as we become more like Christ, then it's going to be that distinction. So we have to, this idea of separation is of among them. And then of attachment. Of attachment. Verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Yeah, we know the priests weren't allowed to touch anything unclean. Uh, while they were going through their ceremony, if they touched it, boy, they were in trouble. They could not do it. But the word touch there, and touch not, actually in the, in, the, in the Greek refers to attaching oneself, being attached to it. I mean, we may touch some things in this world, but let's don't be attached to it. Don't get attached to carnality. Don't get attached to sin. Don't get attached to unclean things. Hello? Problem is, we like to be attached to it. We like to be attached to worldly things and carnal ways and sinful attitudes and actions. But he said, no, don't be attached to it. You can't, you bump up against somebody and touch them or you, you, you're working somewhere and you have to pick up some beer bottles and put them away. Oh, I can't touch it. It's unclean. No. Don't get attached to it. Don't get attached to it. And so they've got these practices that God gives us there for separation. For why? Not so we're holier than thou. Not so we can feel good about ourselves. Not so we can put little check marks. Oh, back in the 70s, that's the way it was in many fundamental churches. Boy, got this, got that, got that. No, it's not holier than thou, but it's holier than thou. And it's to be perfecting of holiness in the fear of God to be more like the Savior. And that's what God tells us there about this idea of separation. So, we've got the perfection of holiness. Who's the perfection of holiness? God. That is perfection. If we could just grab a hold of that, boy, it'll change our prayer life, it'll change our Christian walk, it'll change our praise, it'll change our hearts, it'll change our desire, that He is holy, absolute holy. But then the perfecting of holiness is the holiness of the saints. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God by putting away those things. So as we look at these things in the beauty of what class? Holiness. Holiness. Oh, I'm really holy. Oh, you blew it. No, he's holy. He's holy. He's holy. And I want to see him and be like him. He's holy. He's holy. Not evaluating how holy I am. Because I keep looking at that and I see how holy I'm not. But the goal is to be more like him. More like him. More like him. In the beauty of holiness. Let's bow our heads.